Only about four times in 18 years have I said stop. Only four times. I fly around the world helping people to do things that are quite silly and dangerous and try and make it safer. Right, James, you're going first. The last 18 years, I have a work ranging from Top Gear right up to Mission Impossible. A lot of it is planning for worst case scenarios. What happens when a lorry hits a brick wall? With Jezza, I'd go up to him and I'd say, look, we know this is a big hit. You might be knocked out. We need to have a safe word. And Jeremy gave me a word he would remember afterwards. It began with C. <laughs> Two names I'm going to put out there. That is one of those things where you can only plan for so much. Andy, welcome to the podcast. If someone has clicked on this podcast today and is wondering why they should stay to the end and what are they going to hear, what would you say to them? <laughs> so... For the last 18 years, I have uh, worked with some very interesting, crazy people, uh, ranging from Top Gear, when they actually started, right up to Mission Impossible and film productions like that, helping people do some quite interesting, silly, crazy things. And so that leads me on nicely to say, Andy, in your own words, who are you and what do you do? I'm Andy. I... Hard to explain. I fly around the world helping people to do things that are quite silly and dangerous and we try and make it safer to do it. And my, stereo, my stereotypical view of someone that works in health and safety, fire and rescue, is an apologies for this. I think this would be the same as a lot of audience. Is someone almost similar to a parking attendant that's kind of annoying that they're there, getting in the way of everything that everybody wants to do with a very stiff upper lip, keeping everybody safe and secure until something bad happens, then we all praise them. But with you, the first time I ever met you, the first time I ever saw you, you were spinning up your wheels, approaching Podium Place in your 458 Speciale with the number plate ADHD space AF. That has come from running this wild business. What? Have I got the complete wrong view of what a safety guy is? Yeah, I mean, technically I am a health and safety advisor, but I kind of, I'm not. I'm more of a facilitator. So when Red Bull F1 won the championship a couple of years ago, they want to shut down the streets of Milton Keynes and run F1 cars through the streets. So they come to me and they're like, we've got safety problems here. The council is saying this is dangerous. So I'll go in and kind of hopefully schmooze the council into saying it's not dangerous. This is how we're going to do it. And this is what we're going to do. So that's kind of... And you've worked on some of the most insane films. like, And it's even before I did this episode today, I had an idea of some of the stuff you've worked on. But we just had a catch up in your office behind us, which is at this incredible studio complex that we'll get onto later. But to list some, Top Gear, Mission Impossible. You've just mentioned you're working with Colin Furs, YouTuber, KSI. I met you through Ben Collins, my friend The Stig. What on earth have I just not listed out? How much stuff have you worked on? It, it's, it's nuts. It's only when I do chats like this or if I, um, like when I design my website, I look at it and I'm like, wow, this company is amazing. And then I realise it's mine because I never really have time to really embrace what we've done. But you know, getting to work on a Bond film, that was my aim years ago and getting to do that and just all the cool stuff we do with uh, you know, Red Bull, Monster Energy. Like this weekend, I'm working at the F1 British Grand Prix this weekend for Monster Energy. And I'm like, I'm getting paid for a living to do the stuff which is my dream to do. So, yeah, I'm pretty pretty lucky with it all. I so love it. Before we get on to exactly some of the bits that you've worked on in the past, some stories of how you kept the Top Gear trio in, in safe hands, really, which must have been a horrendously difficult job. Do you want to just give us a summary of what your business actually is that, you, that you've got? So then I think once people understand what that looks like, then we can apply it to all of these stories that we'll go into. So... Originally, 18 years ago, we were a motorsport rescue team for like rallies and, and like you know, a volunteer unit. And then we started working on Top Gear back when it first started at Dunsfold, the original Top Gear back in the day. So that was 2006 when I started. And then I was in the fire brigade then. So I was still doing my fire brigade shifts, then around my shift patterns, working on Top Gear, working on motorsport events. And I just had ideas on how to commercialize it, brand it, make it bigger. Um, we then Fast and Furious 6 came along in 2012. So that was, I thought, okay, I've got to leave the fire brigade now. No one leaves the fire brigade. It's a job for life. But I made that decision. 
Um, went on Fast and Furious, spent three months in Tenerife on second unit for that. Got hooked and just started growing the business from there, employing people, buying ambulances, fire engines, you know, all of that sort of cool stuff. And then I, I don't actually like business. It doesn't really interest me. I like doing the sort of stuff I do. But if I want the cars I want, sadly, I've got to be in business. So I kind of use that and, to fund And it is all. that one of your drivers, the fact that you just wanted cool shit, essentially? You wanted McLaren 720S that we've seen on Carwell. You've gone up against Matt Watson. You've broken the record on Carwell. You wanted 458 Speciales. Like, and to make that happen, you've put together this incredible business, MSS. But you didn't actually, you're not really interested in the business side of stuff. You were never too entrepreneurial. No, I think, I mean, I've never written a business plan. I just, you know, build the business as it goes. But yeah, in the back of my mind, I knew as a firefighter that I was limited on the money I could make and I love cars. So I thought I've got to kind of keep growing the business. And then now I'm in a position where I almost, because when you're in business, as you know, there's haters, there's people that don't like, you know, how things grow and the positivity. So now half of it is like, I've got to keep funding cool cars. And then the other <laughs> half of it is sort of like, I can't let, haters win so the business has to work so i'll just keep working the hours that i work and doing what we do to make the business a success and to support the people that work for us like usual these podcasts have worked me up an appetite and we're out on the road all day in the van heading to different places around the uk usually the thing we do is stop and have fast food. But this all changed when the guys from Y Food got in touch with me. See, these drinks in front of me have got 26 vitamins and minerals in. They are packed full of fiber, protein. They're lactose free, gluten free, and they even have vegan options too. There are loads of different flavors to choose from, but my personal favorite has to be the happy banana. Literally, instead of stopping for our normal food, I now just net one of these and it sorts me out all the way to my next meal. So if you're like me and you're constantly on the go and you just don't have time to bring a packed lunch or make something at home, grab yourself a Y food. I've got a link in the description down below for you to order a taster pack and using the discount code on screen, you can get yourself a good discount too. Anyway, back to the podcast. Cheers, Y food. So what Obviously, you just mentioned there that you went from being in the fire service, which to be fair, I had in the back of my head that I thought that was your way into what you do today. But just touching on, so when you were younger in your teens, was it the plan to end up in the fire service and preventing basically hell and fire and protecting people? Or what was sort of stuff was you into as a kid? Was it cars, your driver? What was it that made you end up in the position where you were a fireman? Yeah, so I came out of the army, um, wasn't really sure what I was going to do after I left the forces. And a friend of mine was in the fire brigade. And it's like kids' dreams, isn't it, being in the fire brigade? It's really cool. So I applied for it, got in, and really enjoyed it. Loved being in the fire brigade. But I'd always been into cars. I'd always like watched motorsport. So in the fire service, I went down the RTA rescue route. So I was an RTA rescue instructor. So I'd teach the fire service how to do, how to cut cars apart. I'd start working there with race circuits as well, and all the volunteer rescue units there, and working with them on coaching them and training with them in RTA rescue. Got into the medical side of it as well, because again, that's all car related. When you're a firefighter and you're going to a house fire, it's actually really boring because everything's dark, it's really hot, it's smoky, you can't see anything. It's just a bit rubbish. Whereas big RTAs on a motorway, yes, it's pretty serious stuff, but I found it really interesting because it's all about how, how cars are put together. It's more of a problem-solving situation a little bit as well, is it? I'm guessing. So So what you're saying is even though something could be quite a morbid and brutal, you were quite enjoying like the problem-solving element and the stuff around cars. Like, how has this happened? How are we going to sort of fix this situation? Is that the bit that captivated you and why you like motorsports as well? Yeah, I think I don't know about a massive amount of stuff, but I do know about cars and I know about how they're put together, which is why now in motorsport, my son's competing in rally cross so I can understand how to build a car because I know how to cut them apart so I know how to put them back together again. So it's sort of that part of the fire service where, as you say, it is brutal, some of it, but I was quite good at dealing with, with RTAs and how a big, very serious incident, how I can detach any moral and feelings from it and just concentrate on this person is going to die soon unless we do this so we have to get this done and then afterwards that's then when you get home that's then when the emotions have been in the fire service and the the shit really really bad days you have to deal with but at the time you're just concentrating on this is what we have to do you're a team of firefighters boom let's get it done and saying boom let's get it done 
that must have been the same sort of reaction when you first started working on Top Gear, right? Or did you just not know what that show was going to become? And how did you start working on Top Gear, become the biggest show in the world? Yeah, so we were doing uh, the volunteer stuff for motor, motor racing rallies mainly. And then 2006 was when I first started on it. And I started working with an old mate, just literally a, a volunteer rescue unit at Dunsfold. But this was back when Top Gear was just starting to get a bit of momentum. And then the first sort of like big location job we did was when Hammond did the Eurofighter versus the Veyron. So when that you came along... You literally got a poster on yeah, your yeah, wall in yeah. your office. I saw that. I mean, that was like proper shivers when you're seeing that. When you're actually there for that episode was like phenomenal. You know, that is a proper big, big episode. So when that happened, we knew it was going to come along. Uh, the production team just booked an ambulance and I was like okay, this is a Eurofighter versus a Veyron. There's a lot more to this. Can I be involved in the planning? Can I work out what fire rescue cover we have, how we plan it, how we coordinate the emergency services response, how we work with the Royal Air Force? So I kind of wanted to take that responsibility on. So the production team said to me, yeah. So we managed to just sort of like uh, coordinate the, the behind the scenes safety for it, for that massive thing. And then from that, we then started going abroad with the show, traveling all over the world, uh, you know, three or four person team just behind the scenes for all the big, big adventures. So what does then, if you could just break that down for us, and we'll start with that episode of Bugatti Veyron, Eurofighter Typhoon. It's had millions of views. I'm sure that most people that are listening to this now, if they haven't seen it, they're going to go and click on that and watch it, but it's likely they would have. Take us through then what all that stuff is that you have to plan. What is there that you are essentially doing and planning to to make sure there's less risk of something going wrong? Yeah, so sadly, a lot of it is planning for worst case scenarios. I have to look at the worst things that could go wrong, which is a bit negative when you're in a real positive world of TV and your role is to look at the bad things going wrong. So we think, okay, what what's going to happen? Can the UFI crash? Can the, the car crash? Is Hammond going to go off the end? Is the jet wash from the from the jet takes off? Is that going to, is the thrust going to affect where the car's going and stuff? So there's all that you've got to think about behind the scenes. So you then got to think, right, what, what rescue cover do we have? Where do we put people? You've got a two mile film set as well. And you're going about, I think it was about a mile out around and back again. But you've got this two mile area where there could be debris. So you've got to think, like, where do we put response teams? How do we plan all this? And that's just where combining my understanding of motorsport and cars and then my understanding of emergency services just all comes together. It's, it's what I understand. It's what I know about. So I must ask, I was absolutely rubbish at maths and science at school. Like subjects were not my strong point. Do you ever find yourself... We A, were you good at that sort of thing at school? Do you have to use a lot of that in what you're saying you're doing? Because I'm guessing if you're planning the thrust coming off the back of a Euro fighter and is and what sort of, is that going to generate? Is it going to push the car? Out? How do you even go about doing that? <laughs> yeah. So school and academics is another totally different subject. I didn't even go to school in the last week. Um, I can't count. I have this discount clear. So it's like dyslexia, but numbers. So I can't actually count as well. It's the other weird thing. I can do basic counting up and down, but comp you know, taking away and um, times tables means absolutely nothing to me. Um, so that sort of stuff is where I just have to use my mind to think about, okay, well, thrust is going that way. A car goes that way. There's downforce there. As the jet takes off, it does that. It might give the car more downforce so there. almost like picture-based. Yeah, is my mind works differently to normal minds. So obviously I've got ADHD, I have dyscalculia. My mind isn't like a normal mind, so I see things. I don't have plans and instructions. I just, as you say, picture-based, just understanding how things work, really, I suppose. Do, do you know what? That right there is one of the reasons that I started this podcast, is to give people that think that stuff can hold them back in getting somewhere and show that so many people have pushed through those barriers. Like, you literally can't, because of a condition or just the way your brain works, do something. And then everybody that I speak to that's got themselves in these positions just finds a way of problem solving it. Like, oh, I'll just do it picture-based. And every cool thing that people end up seeming to work on, like you working on Top Gear, the people that you end up speaking to, it's about how those guys gel, how you get together. And in the end, everything all works out and comes together. But were you always viewed as then the big bad wolf, the annoying person on those shoots, if you had to go around and plan all that stuff? And and how often would you have to say, oh, I'm not sure about this, guys? Yeah, so it, that's where it's difficult because say it's a positive environment you're in. If you're working on a, on a show with like a really famous actor or presenters, 
for me to ask something negative is a bit of a bad thing because the directors want everyone really positive. So I've got a plan in back of my mind what we're going to do. And I've also got to pick the time when I talk to people about bad things. So if we're doing a, um, a stunt sequence, for example, I'll go up to the stunt cord and I say, that obviously, the, the stunt performance doing the car rollover. Just want, are they allergic to anything? Is there, have they got previous injuries we need to know about? Because that's obviously what the paramedic team need to know about. But this person's about to flip a car over. So I can't, I've got to pick the time that I do it so I don't chuck something massively negative in to spoil what is a positive, you know, real cool culture to work in. That isn't, that's a quite a hard thing to do then in terms of those people. Would you, did you ever get a moment where you obviously worked with the most famous motoring trio in the world, Clarkson, Hammond and May. All of us have got an understanding from where we've watched that show of different bits of the personalities that make each one of those up. I'm guessing if I just looked at it, but I may be wrong, that the two more amicable ones would be Clarkson and uh, would be Hammond and May, sorry, with the probably less safety amicable one being Clarkson. Am I right? Or was Hammond a little bit more? problematic yeah. i mean hammond is committed he loves <laughs> I, I used to get on quite well with richard because we were both into land droves. we both lived in the countryside our kids were the same sort of ages so when i used to work with those guys back then it was kind of richard i would just chat with about stuff um jeremy is a a force of nature a creative genius of a man that's just created as we all know something absolutely phenomenal james is james he is exactly as as he comes across the thing with jeremy is though it's he's created this massive thing and obviously i'm there to kind of back in the day try and keep things sensible as we we're saying about so there'd be scenes where we did this military vehicle shoot down in dorset and like Remember there's a it. lot of stuff on fire and i'm like jezza we need to cut because we've got to put these gorse bushes out and he's like well keep filming keep filming i'm like we're half a Dorset is going to be on fire soon and it's just like so you've got to kind of like work with Jeremy on this and work around that creative genius of who he is so he's I would never interrupt him and let him he's doing his thing behind the scenes I'm like okay let's get a water bounce over there let's get this there let's you know go and cut that down there because that's about to catch fire so it was just kind of working behind that creativity that he has it that's such a hard thing to do because especially in a lot of the people that i meet now that are creatives if they're youtubers and this kind of new wind and force of all these kind of creative characters coming through and what they're good at and what they're not when i was sat speaking to mike fern a couple of weeks ago about working with the motoring trio he's obviously lead presenter at drive tribe and he spoke about working with jeremy as his voice just encapsulates the whole area it's like the best broadcasting voice in the world or one of and that must be a very hard thing to be able to to get in there and actually have some sense of control like and i guess if something goes wrong is the first person the finger's going to be pointed at you so do you have to somehow manage to put your foot down on these guys and is that where maybe your background in the military helps yeah it's it's an interesting one so when Jezza went through the um, through the brick wall in the lorry. Do you remember that episode? Oh, I was going to ask about yeah, that episode yeah. because this is the stuff you're having to control. Eurofighter Typhoon versus Bugatti. Oh, we're just about to drive these lorries through a wall. Like yeah. it's insane. That that was that was big, and obviously that's not been done before. It's all unique. So a guy called Jim Dowdler, I've worked with loads. Jim is a stunt coordinator. Jim is like this industry legend. He was a stormtrooper back in the day. He's he's like. The, you know, he is a legend in the stunt industry. So Jim was coordinating and I'm working with Jim and we're thinking, this hasn't been done before. What happens when a lorry hits a brick wall? And just before we call action, we're still drilling bits of, you know, concrete out just to try and like work out how to get around it. But with Jezza, I'd go up to him and I'd say, look, we know this is a big hit. I just, we, you might be knocked out. Can we have a word? Can we just have a safe word? And that is our word that I know that you remembered 10 minutes before. So there's like, if you have been knocked out, I understand your level of consciousness sort of thing. And uh, and Jeremy gave me a word, which was the word which we would use that he would remember afterwards. It began with C, that word. <laughs> so we get this like, episode yeah, demonetized, yeah, but I yeah. guess it ended with T. So yeah, so it's like, so when he goes through it, we go up to the, the lorry afterwards and he hit, I mean, nothing is edited on Top Gear. It is all real. What you see happens, and Jezza was always particular, and whatever happens, you keep filming. It's reality. There was no, nothing was faked. It was all the stuff which I saw was all real. And I'm going up to Jezza and going, Jesus, you, you're right. And he's like, I haven't said the word. And it's like, okay, cool. <laughs> he, he remembers the word. So it's just working out things like that and trying to almost add a bit of, not comedy to it, because it is a serious, 
you know, subject and see a show, but just having that, um, you know, informality behind the scenes on how we can make things as safe as we can with it. You've worked on that show. You worked on that show for years. You're still working with many different motorsport shows, many different TV shows, automotive led films that are automotive led. We didn't even mention earlier Bond. Can they get away with pretty much anything that they want to do in the sense of what? where is the barrier? Because you're an external company that's being brought in to manage the safety of something. Like people go, oh, if you do X, you're going to get cancelled because like if it's not safe enough, you could get in trouble. What, where is the re- legislation and the law there? Why is it if they did something really bad that they could get in trouble or could have could they back in the day? Like was Top Gear 2004, 2006, would the rules have been different to Top Gear of now and like what you could get away with doing in the realms of safety? I think um, lots of stuff has changed. How things are kept safe is still the same. The issue is more is how the culture is, social media, for example, how things are shared online. We did a, a big project for Apple Studios a few years ago and public could see where we were filming. And I'm worried that someone's going to take a photograph of someone working on a building site for a set build that we're doing without wearing a harness or something and then share at Apple Studios or something like that. So I think what's changed with, especially we were saying about this cancel culture, is how social media can be shared and can make people look really bad when things go wrong because the the two that i'm trying to to draw basically difference in is in 2006 hammond was driving a vampire jet car at 320 mile an hour one of the tires blew out on that vehicle at dunsfold causing it to spin out of control crash flipping upside down and ultimately leaving him in a coma yet recently we all know we can't discuss too much of it for legal reasons but freddie flintoff was on Top Gear, he had an accident, Top Gear is no more now. Like, the show couldn't continue. What was different about that situation back there, the really serious accident happening, but the show not being cancelled, versus that of today? Yeah, I think back then, it was... I mean, Hammond's crash was big. That was a, a big, big crash, and we'd work with that vehicle. We weren't working on that that shoot, because we were on a different Top Gear project that day. Um, but that was, that was huge. They're both very, very serious massively serious things you know i think when you look at these shows there are going to be accidents when you no matter how safe you make it things will go our bodies are only designed to go as fast as we can run you know we now go in cars at 200 miles an hour it adds this massive new level of risk on there so that is part part of the more you do riskier things the more chance you've got of having big accidents but i think when going back to your question is that what has, has happened between them when these things happen, it is a big learning curve for people and then safety, then people, you learn from safety. I think it's Elon Musk has that quote, um, failure is an option here. Because, you know, there's that old space quote, failure is not an option. Elon says failure is an option here. If you don't fail, then it means you're not innovating enough. So it's like you, you learn more when things go wrong. That's why I think when things go wrong, especially on big shows like the sort of projects that I work on, that's where you learn about the mistakes and you do things better in the future. And I'm guessing people learn a lot from that particular scenario. Or do you have to just look at that and go, a wheel blew off a jet car at 320 mile out. I can't believe he's alive. Yeah. But- I mean, that was, there's a HSE investigation into it, which is actually published, which anyone can read. So the HSE investigation is really interesting, explaining about the tyres, the car, the training that went into it all. But again, you're doing 306 miles an hour, I think it was. It's kind of that isn't a safe thing to do and it was well in fact ollie webb said on your podcast the other listened to it two days ago as he said when he's doing a 300 mile an hour um car run or 200 mile an hour or something at that speeds there's not really much skill to it it's kind of you are flat out and you're just keeping your fingers crossed that no tires explode you do, you come off it's straight it's a automatic car and that's where when you look at that you think okay it's it's not so much a skill it certainly wasn't richard's fault that that happened but it's um it's a a massive accident because you're doing those sort of speeds. We all know motorsport is dangerous. And if we're going to do these shows, there is that risk with it. Now, I know it wasn't you guys because you mentioned you're on another Top Gear shoot that day working for something else, but I'm guessing there was a safety team on site that day. There would have been an ambulance and fire. Yeah, yeah. It was ran by, I think it was the the airfield. It was at Elvingdon Airfield. So on on a shoot, on a TV shoot, and I think we all expect that it's probably norm that there'll be an ambulance and a fire vehicle nearby when someone's doing something slightly crazy on something like that. Do you think the fact that those guys were there, I haven't read the report, 
is the fact that Richard, each one of those little things is the fact that he actually still was able to be alive to this day. Do you think if someone wasn't there in those safety vehicles, it would have been completely oh, 100%. different? 100%. And you've got to look at as well, um, Ben Collins, he did some coaching for Richard he, and he said, this is the type of helmet you need to have. I think it's Ari GP3 or something like that helmet. That's referenced in the HSC report. This is one of the reasons why Richard is alive. And as you say, having that emergency services team there, when someone is involved in a car crash or anything like that, when you go unconscious, your airway goes. You don't control your neck muscles anymore. Your head goes down. You have no airway. You've got two minutes to open someone's airway. So if they've got a helmet in a car with a roll cage debris on fire, you've got that clock is ticking to get that airway open and get them breathing. You know, it's as soon as someone's unconscious, that is where the risk is. And I want to go into later, basically the best stories, everything from James Bond, everything you've worked on. There must be just some incredible stories coming out of that. But there's actually like a more pressing thing that I always have in the back of my mind these days. And this podcast, obviously I've featured people that have been on TV, Ben Collins, lots of those those guys that have done that work. Mike Brewer, obviously traveling around with Wheeler Dealers. And I'm starting to learn just how different TV is to YouTube. But YouTube is now becoming this huge thing. Look at Ben Collins now. He was involved in TV. Still does a bit here and there, but his main thing is now a YouTube channel. You recently featured um, at a day or you were present at a day working with MSS when Ben invited myself down and Matt Armstrong to Dunsfold to drive the X reasonably priced cars around the Top Gear track. Yeah. Myself and Matt also brought a supercar each. He brought his Porsche GT3. And I bought my Hurricane Performante and we were going to film a video for Matt's channel, which was us two racing around the track. And you just happened to be there. Matt had no clue there was even going to be any form of safety vehicle present that yeah, day at all. <laughs> what then occurred is that on Matt's first lap on cold tyres, he hit the bump at follow through far too fast. The car then span out and went into the field. And if you actually then go and watch that, it could have so easily flipped and rolled over. Now, you were over across that field in that vehicle in two minutes. And that really hit home to me a few weeks later. And so this question's a little bit long. But a few weeks later, we went to Spain and there's a video out and we drove around the Autodrome Terramar. They did it on the Grand Tour. A banked 78 degree concrete circuit where we were getting up to speeds of around 85 mile an hour whilst completely sideways. Now, when I watched the boys do that on the Grand Tour, I'm guessing there would have been a fire vehicle present. There would have been an ambulance present. They were all wearing helmets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There'll always be something on TV. And often you won't see it, but it'll be hidden somewhere. There will be fire and ambulance on all the... So we make a similar style film, albeit filmed with one camera, some GoPros and a DJI drone versus an entire TV set and fire safety crews and ambulances and all the rest. Of it. But that film goes out and it's now achieving good revenue, over four and a half million views. It is a complete show of its own. Do you think, and this is where the question part comes in, do you look at us YouTubers doing this stuff now and think, one of these guys is going to have a big wake-up call at some point. Yeah, but it's more than that. So I've been chatting with a lot of people about this sort of thing, a lot of like YouTubers, and this has come up a lot recently. It's not so much the wake-up call for something going wrong and, um, and not setting things up. It's more the... I think YouTubers need to have an awareness of the bigger risk, the corporate risk, the risk to their brand and their reputation and the whole prosecution side of it as well. If someone else gets hurt with what they're doing, you know, these YouTubers that do like base jumping, for example, we've done a lot of base jumping activities with YouTubers. One of the guys we did it with is no longer with us because he'd been the wingsuit into a wall. Now, those sort of activities he was doing, I was on the top of Heron Tower, central London, what was it? one of the biggest buildings in central London. And we were just doing a scene with him doing a base jump. He wasn't actually going to do a base jump. He just had the rig on. It was a scene with him at the top of the tower. And I said to him, if you're going to jump, so no one else is going to hear this conversation, it's just me and you. If you are going to jump, obviously the scene is not jumping. The scene is you at the edge. If you are going to jump, I need to know because I need to make sure that it's cleared down on the ground. We need to make sure we've got some sort of medical cover in place. We need to make sure that no members of the public can get taken out when you land with a parachute. And he was like, no, 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 I'm not going to jump. And when we did this scene, he looked over at me and winked. And I was like, no. And he was just joking. He didn't jump. But it was like, that was one of those times I thought to myself, 
what YouTubers do, and a lot of the more daring, risky people that climb to the top of Canary Wharf and all this, so there's a guy called Nightscape we've worked with before. Um, he had a sponsorship deal with Timberland, I think it was, and we were doing a commercial with him for Timberland. But I think YouTubers need to have an awareness of your reputational risk and how if something goes wrong, that cancel culture is going to hit you massively, and that's you done. You are a business, you are a company, you are a, a brand, no different to the Grand Tour doing something to like we were doing at that airfield, which is why behind the scenes we had things in place on that day. Do you think, sadly, that won't happen until something goes wrong? Yeah, yeah, it is going to go wrong. But it also, so the stuff I've done with Colin Furs, for example, he he gets big brand deals with like massive companies and he will bring me in to kind of like um, give some assurance to the companies that are sponsoring him for what he's going to do. So whether it's, he did some stuff with the BBC, for example, and I will go in and just sort of like, um, professionalise the behind the scenes safety and work out how we can do those sort of activities um, to make sure that everyone's protected and to a degree he's protected as well. Because I've not, I've not actually taken that into account that the fact that obviously a lot of the YouTuber stuff is being sponsored and ultimately the force will be the sponsors saying we won't sponsor unless X, Y and Z is because because YouTube is just exploding at the minute. The views, the revenue, everything on the platform is just going through the roof because it's real easy to watch content that it can be three mates driving too fast around a concrete dome with absolutely nothing. And it's it's very real. But what I worry about, and it is genuinely, I've started to think it through a lot more recently, but the more stuff that I've been lucky enough to be involved in and kind of exposed to and see, but... When I was growing up, um, our family, we used to have a factory that made some walling for houses. And even from a young age up until like late teens when I was there, I saw how much the factory came on in terms of safety. Like every day, something could be changed to make something better. And sometimes, sadly, as a result of things happening, I remember one lad cut his finger off in a machine and then it was realised that why could he even get to that bit of the machine? Why was he in there? Well, he was in there because of this. Well, we need to make a protocol that there's a bit of fencing there and then there's a lock to be able to get in. But then people would say, when you're having these conversations in a pub or in wherever with a group of mates, you'd be like, or some granddad would go, well, back in my day yeah, when we yeah. were doing it in the factory, there was none of that stuff. And like, we all used to be all right. But then there was also those cases where someone really wasn't all right. But it does hit home that like, in like a period of like 50, 60 years, stuff just goes, has to come on such a long way like it does in factories. And I worry that where a lot of the world has kept up with that, whether it be manufacturing environments, whether it be television, whether it be all these places that are kind of not regulated, but just kept a bit safer for the well-being of the people on it. I do actually worry that this YouTube space doesn't have any of it whatsoever. And we are currently the archaic dinosaurs just going out and doing absolutely crazy st stuff with, with huge risk. And it was only when we went round the Autodrome Terramar and we went up on these concrete banks and looked down and could see the sheer drop and the trees and the walls that I really saw of as much as he's one of my best pals going and I, everything we get to do is absolutely amazing. I thought, Matt, really? Really? Could we have not just squeezed the helmets in the boot? Yeah. 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 Like, like there is just this little thing that triggers a little bit with it. And, does, does that worry you then when you look at all of us? I think those you're talking about factories and all that, there is, you know, legislation, there's rules, there's policies, all health and safety sort of stuff for them. TV, film, YouTube, content, it's unregulated. There is no real rules for it all. So there's no one to tell you this is how you can sh should do it. So that's where you've got to kind of like think up how can we make, how can we protect people? How can we do this safe? It's where like helmets, for example, we've had jobs in middle of Nevada, uh, Michelle Rodriguez doing 200 mile an hour across the desert in Nevada. And it was like, we, we're about to do this film. And they were like, hold on, we haven't, has anyone got the helmet? And it's like, oh yeah. And it's like, no, it's a skateboard helmet. We need to go and get a race helmet from somewhere. It's the planning behind it all. But you would know. you then stop that? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So you have, do you have the ability to stop that? I only about four times in 18 years have I said stop. Only four times. It's very because the planning will be in place and the TV and film industry is getting really good at being on top of safety. But there are there has been four times I've gone, stop, this is we shouldn't be doing this. This is bad. We need to have a rethink. And every time I've done that, people have come up to me afterwards and gone, no, we got caught up in the in the moment, we got caught up in the creativity. That was the right decision. Can you I've give got, us one of those examples? Um uh, I think I've got to be careful which ones to talk about. There has been times where um, 
on feature films, well, I've gone, okay, well, we shouldn't be doing this. And, you know, massive, big Hollywood movie sort of things where everyone's focus on a film, when it's the big action scenes and the big stunts, you've got, like, amazing stunt coordinators, like the best stunt coordinators in the world that are working and choreographing these massive stunts. And they're all done really safe because everyone's focus is on that. But then you'll have another bit where someone will be doing some... I know some um, building a set over this side of it and someone's going to light a fire to make it look like there was a little fire on the ground. And it's like, well, guys, hold on. We're in the middle of a cornfield and we're lighting the floor to make it look like there's been a fire and there's no extinguishers anywhere. And it's a scene where later on the cornfield actually does set fire. So was mate... it whistling diesel, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So it's just sort of like trying to preempt, but yeah. But then that's what goes wrong. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. That's, that exactly. actually thinking about it we then get to see via YouTube and someone that doesn't have any fire safety present, someone literally set light to an entire cornfield because they've done it wrong, which is what I'm referring to. Whistling Diesel in his Ferrari, if you haven't seen it, check it out on YouTube. Literally set light to an entire cornfield. He lost the car and everything, didn't he, I think? He did, but then I I suppose what I don't think's happened is something sadly bad enough yet to hit home with one of the YouTubers where they raise this as a thing to say, come on, guys, I actually is what we're doing kind of silly. Because you've even worked with the likes of KSI, right? Yeah, so, but this is what's interesting. YouTube, and especially, it was was JJ, it was KSI that that made me understand this. Working with YouTubers are, you guys are very creative. You don't have anyone giving you direction. You're generally setting up your cameras yourself. There's no first assistant director to call action or anything. It's just freestyle and done your way. And when YouTubers are now working on television productions and content where there's a director, I think it's a bit of an interesting one because it's sort of like, no one's told them what to do before. And suddenly there's a scripted element to it and you're being told this. And I think a lot of YouTubers find that a bit interesting that suddenly someone's telling them what they need to do. Whereas the whole point of YouTube is it's giving you the power to do things your way massively informally. I do think, and I've seen it, that YouTube is going to get more and more. And I now, some evenings, I will sit and watch one of Matt Armstrong's videos at home on a Friday night instead of watching a feature film on telly. I watched something about him take, uh, was it rebuilding a Nissan GTR wing. It's my Friday night. And I'm watching him rebuild the wing of a Nissan GTR instead of watching a £300 million Tom Cruise movie. It's kind of, I'm being drawn into that as well. It is starting to change. I, I think what's really needed is some sort of YouTuber based car show, would be so, so cool. That's sort of like a, an informal, fun, but safe car show for with, with YouTubers making it. I think it'd be amazing. I think the, the challenge for YouTubers is, I totally agree, but when, when we're put that question, we think, well, hang on, isn't that just YouTube? Isn't that yeah, just... Yeah, it is. Isn't that just... You, you come back to, isn't it just collaboration because YouTube is one of the biggest comments under all of basically Matt's videos when we all went away and did, it was myself, Nico, um, Matt, we all went away and did the driving around the Autodrome Terramar and people were like, you guys should be the new Grand Tour Drio or, yeah. or whatever. And it's like, but you do ask yourself, you can't help asking yourself the question where it's just like, well, you can watch it on YouTube anyway. Yeah. So I guess, but then would we work in that environment that you've seen where actually being told stuff scripted it's so yeah. different is it i always think about would you're someone that spent a lot of time with the trio hammond's done a lot of youtube stuff but i wonder the other two do you think james could could come into our world and go the other way yeah james james i don't know jeremy's just very good at adapting himself to, to anything i mean he's now running a farm you know it's like he's a genius so he can just adapt himself to anything but i think that there is definitely something out there some sort of new youtuber show i think it's informality people like the friendliness the informality the non-scripted the niceness of youtube that you're seeing something real something which feels humble and genuine and honest and um same as like the car wow drag videos the numbers of people they're watching and they're in the millions like within within days and do they have safety there Yes, yeah, 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 they have. They're, they're set up on a proper airfield. They have got safety set up there. Yeah, yeah. But it's um, the, the numbers, are, the, their figures are But is massive. that a choice bar? The point I'm getting at, the bit I'm trying to understand, is, is that a choice by Carwell to do that? Would they actually have to do that? They wouldn't. Because they're just making a YouTube video. Yeah, but they are a company. 
with a big brand, a big reputation behind it. So I don't know how Carwell do it, but somewhere there is a, someone must have done a risk assessment for it and then from that to determine what is needed, how it's needed, because it's only when it goes wrong that people are going to say, you know, what is in place. So I think the first thing that's going to be happen is the investigator, so the local authority or the HSE, health and safety executive, are going to ask for the risk assessment, a plan, what went wrong, what happened, evidence, and that's then when people get proper shafted. And do you know what? I actually had, um, and most, most, I'm sure too many th- people think this way. When I went to the day with Ben and we filmed on Dunsfold before Matt took the Porsche out in the afternoon, I saw your fire safety truck sat there, saw you going through all the procedures, filling it up with water, making sure you knew where the hydrant, the hose was, talking to Ben, talking about where the camera guy is going to be stood in the field and where they could position himself so there was less risk. So all you going through all of it. And part of me, in my head, I couldn't help it, just thought, is there much point? Like, are these guys actually going to do anything cool day to day or are we just going to drive around and they're going to be sat in the truck all day with absolutely nothing to do? But then right in front of my eyes where Matt went off, nearly rolled a car and suddenly your vehicle is in the field, pulling him out of the field, making sure everybody's fine and safe and he's there on hand. How often does stuff actually go wrong? Yeah, so not very often. That's the thing. It's especially on TV and film. So much planning goes into it. It's quite rare that things go wrong. Motorsport, it's a bit different. <laughs> yeah, the first YouTube video <laughs> yeah, that you went to, you were in the field. <laughs> yeah, there's some. But it's like uh, motorsport, like we were doing British touring cars a couple of weeks ago. We have an ambulance on that, um, race circuits. We had a we had a drift event years ago at, I can't remember where it was, it was some drift event at Donington. We had like six car fires in one day just because it's, you know, drift cars and fiberglass and carbon fiber and heat and flames generally bring all that together you've got a nice little fire going on but i'm sure there's been many things where something has gone wrong in your first on hand as yeah, well yeah what, yeah what but you we... can get quite complacent with it we did when we did um fast and furious six we were just doing every day there was the stunt guys are flipping cars rolling this exploding that and i remember we did a, a car roll over in um we did a test for it in a place called long cross studios and i've you know, watch so many car rollovers, same system, go to the front, I send the firefighter to one side, stunt coordinator goes on the side, checks the stunt performance, all right, I give the thumbs up to the paramedic, blah, blah, blah. This one, same as always, went to the front of it and the headlight had popped out and there was this orange flickering, heaty like stuff under the bonnet and I was like, huh. I was like, oh, fire. It's fire. <laughs> because in my mind, we've done so many car rollovers at the time that one did catch fire. It's like, so for about a split second, I'm like, oh, fire <laughs> because it's like quick extinguisher quick let's get in get that out but it's just about not becoming um uh what's the word used to it sort of thing because it is normally very very safe and that one time you do get something you've got to make sure going back to as you were saying when i was chatting to ben this is in place there's a fire truck filled with water it's planning 99 percent of the time what a lot of we do isn't brought into effect but for that one percent you've got to make sure that everything is spot and what is because also mentally, it must be really difficult when something does go wrong. It's always afterwards, isn't it? Like, and you must have seen some stuff in this job over the years. Like, it's not an easy thing to do because ultimately, ninety nine point nine nine is like YouTube like buttons to dislike buttons. It's going to be absolutely fine because of the planning you put into a video or into a job. But when the stuff does go wrong, it's not like just me looking at my thumbs down button. Like, it must be really, really difficult. Have you had some situations where? You weren't sure if people were going to make it. It's been so serious. Like, what's been one of the hardest days you've ever had at work? So, back when I was in the fire service, I also used to do ambulance work as well, and I was I was the first ambulance crew on scene at what's called the after nerve at rail disaster. It's one of the biggest rail crashes in UK history, and I was one of the first ambulance crews on scene. Three hundred casualties, nine fatalities, uh, train derailment. Um, is that like suddenly actually being in the movies that you're yeah, watching 100%. being produced? Yeah, it's like you're in a film. It is someone coming up to you, handing you a body part. What do I do with this? And you're like, okay, they are talking. They've got a good airway. They're walking towards me. Keep going that way. You walk past that because that person is, it's called triage. They are okay. So you've got to find the people that can't speak, that are unconscious. So days like that, that was like, I didn't sleep for five days after that. Not through PTSD, but just through adrenaline because you've turned up at a massive rail crash and it is like, just like in a movie. But that job was like, the emergency services response to that was just phenomenal. We had that job done in three hours from start to finish, but it was like the worst, yeah, you cannot put into words what we dealt with that night. 
And um, you guys would have been a relatively small part, a small team in all the people that would have been come together to deal with stuff like that. Does everybody, no matter if you've not met anybody before whatsoever, when a mass event happens and all the different fire crews come together, whether you're privately owned, whether you're part of the government fire service, does everyone just come together and just work in harmony? Just Is that just something that being one of you guys, it all just kind of clicks in those situations? Yeah. I mean, I was just on a normal ambulance, so I just turned up as an ambulance crew on that. Um, and the only reason why we were first on scene was because a major incident had been declared and it was on a remote part of railway track. And they'd actually, um, they form up all the ambulances up on the main road to start planning for a major incident. Because where we were based wasn't far from there. We drove straight down a country lane, straight onto scene. So that's how we were, by accident, the first crew in there sort of thing. But yeah, everyone, emergency services, police, coast guard, fire, ambulance, they all train. They all have the very same systems of work and the equipment is interchangeable. And I'm guessing so, some people didn't make it. Yeah, well, nine fatalities that night. So one of the jobs I had to do was... Um, there was a uh, tarpaulin on the floor and I had to do one of the body counts at one stage of the night. Um, so it was, but then nights like that is, um, that's why when, if things, when we're on a film set and we're going to do something dodgy and someone's like, Andy, you don't seem that worried about it. I'm like, no, that's cool. They're like, yeah, but we're going to do, do this. We're going to have this actor do that or this presenter's going to do that. You don't seem very anxious about it. And I'm like, when things go wrong, I'll let you know because I've seen things go wrong, really go wrong. So that's where I've got in the back of my mind. When you see me getting worried, then it's time to worry. But, you know, because I've had the background of things going wrong really bad. If, but, yeah. So when, but when you've worked with all these guys in, in TV, you know, um, from Bond stunt drivers to the, even the Clarkson boy it's in, and the Grand Tour stuff, do, is there any particular, you don't have to name them, but do you get presenters and stars and actors that are almost so up themselves that they 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 just think that there's no risk to them whatsoever. Um, it's rare. So many of the people that we work with are in the real world. Tom Cruise, a bit of a name drop there, sorry, but Cruise is like he's he's phenomenal. He is he wants to do everything. He wants to know about everything. Wants to learn how everything's done. Him and the stunt team that he worked with have got this amazing relationship and they are just so, so good. At he what does he his does. own stunts, yeah, right? He does what all you see is all, is all, and he's like, I think he's six, is Tom Cruise 60 now, 59 or something. He's, he's not, you know, massively young anymore and, and he's you, still doing You it. watch him doing this in front of your eyes. Like I've been, I'm sure many people may have actually had the opportunity to go and do stuff at Millbrook because everything from dealership test drives take place at Millbrook Proving Ground all the way up to, to film stunts. And I'm pretty sure if you've ever made it onto the Alpine circuit, they call yeah, yeah. it at Millbrook Proving Ground, that the awe instructor would have said, is this your first time on here? And then you say, yes, when it is. And you'll go around and there'll just be a little bit of concrete that's a different colour at the bottom of one of the hills to the rest of the black tarmac track. And they go, that bit of concrete was where the explosives were when they rolled the Aston Martin DBS in the yeah. Bond film. So that's the mate mine I was chatting to yesterday. <laughs> and he worked that and did... He was the guy in the car. That. He was the guy in yeah, the car. Yeah, yeah, I was speaking to him yesterday. So when you see this stuff in front of your eyes and you're on about rolling a car via the use of explosives with trees and barriers around and all that can really protect you is airbags and helmets, but I'm assuming the airbags nah, get airbags switched off. airbags all out, yeah. Um, how do you keep someone safe in that scenario? What is going to stop them from perishing? Yeah, yeah. So that's where things do get expensive and the productions will put the money into bringing a really good stunt team on board. So we did Gran Turismo movie. Um, you know, every day we're doing 180 miles an hour. LMP cars, GT3 race cars, a movie. And that's where I've never had a project where I had the, pres the vice president of physical production for Sony Entertainment had a Zoom call with me at the start and was like, the PlayStation brand and the Gran Turismo brand is worth billions. We're going to make a movie where we know you're going to be doing 180 miles an hour every day. We cannot have an accident. What is needed? So the stunt team on that, um, the stunt coordinators, there was three of them. They are like the best stunt coordinators in the world. Um, they came along. We start planning everything. And I said at the start, the best way to do it is let myself and the stunt team go and find us. We were out in Hungary filming. So let us find, find us an old airfield, give us a load of cars and leave us alone for two weeks. 
and just let us go and play with cars on an airfield for two weeks just to create a, a team that understands it all. And then that obviously went back to production and that's what they did. And they just trusted that stunt team to do these activities for real and to, you know, to do things the proper way and to let the the action the safety behind the action have the priority over everything on Gran Turismo every single camera position on the track before that camera position was confirmed myself and the stunt coordinator would go there we think well our car's going to come this way around the corner it's going to be doing this speed if it comes off it does that we would pre-plan every single camera position there was no we're just going to put a camera there because within 180 miles an hour every day so we've got to make sure that we are so on top of safety when you work with these guys so much, so that's a huge shoot, loads of people involved, but also some of the actors in that film might also be the actors on another film or some of the TV guys you work with, you might end up doing 15 seasons or like what, whatever it is that you're doing. You get to know them pretty well. So two names I'm going to put out there, Richard Hammond, Freddie Flintoff. Are there some people that when you're on sets and shoots and all the rest of it, even though you've got to look at everybody with a very straight brush in the sense of something could happen to him or could happen to them, but I'm really, I am looking at you like over there. Would it get to the point, because you mentioned that you worked with Freddie on A League of Their Own, one of yeah, my yeah. favourite programmes. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Ever, especially the early seasons of A League of Their Own. And they'd be up in the rafters with harnesses on doing stuff in this studio and all the rest of it. It's great fun and heading out. But with people like Freddie and Hammond, do you have like an extra little bit of your eye on them during shoots? They're both quite similar now you mention it, yeah, in their sort of like excitement for doing cool stuff. We did uh, one of the League of Lions with Fred, um, gosh, probably 10 years ago. There was a rally driving special that they did. And um, we put him in a WRC car set him out on the practice lap in the woods, say so League of the Own, everyone's there, all the production team are there. Practice lap in the woods, off he goes, and I'm sort of, he's in the woods, I know the route he's doing, there's certain bits I can see through the trees so I can work out where he's going to be at what time. We didn't put marshals in the woods because I'm like, we're not going to put anyone into that risk area, I can see it all. Okay. And I know it's going to be four seconds between that bunch of trees and that bunch of trees. So if six seconds has gone by and I can't see the car, I know something's gone wrong. So I'm planning this in my head, thinking, okay, it's going to go in a minute. And I hear the sound, which can only be described as the sound of a World Rally car rolling through trees upside down. It's like he's binned it already. You know, he's already sort of like flipped it. So, yeah, on on days like that, um, I say on that show was uh, was an interesting one. But sounds really serious. It's a World Rally car. It's got a roll cage. It's got bucket seats. It's got harnesses. They've got helmets on. They've got fire. Everything that's been put in place to do it safely. And that comes with the risk of those sort of shows. If you're going to put people in a rally car, it is going to happen. If you don't want the risks of these things, then go and work on I don't know, Question Time or Antiques Roadshow. If you're doing shows that will have risky activities, there's going to be more of a risk. How much a helmet's a huge part in saving people's Massive. lives? Massive. Our bodies aren't designed right. We put the most important thing at the top, often around six foot up in the air, our head. We've only got one of them. Look at the design of a human body. It doesn't really... A mouth. The place where we put food is also the same way that oxygen goes in, which is why people choke and die. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, if you are going to design us from the start, you wouldn't do it like we are now. I, when you think about that, like all the things that you've just mentioned in those cars, and I do bring it back to stuff that I've done myself, and you do have to question whether it's worth it, but I just think there's things, especially with like the most competitive people that there are out there, that you must see guys that you look at, you think you are willing to seriously hurt yourself to do this, aren't you? Yeah. Like, do you think there's something that doesn't quite tick right in some of the <laughs> yeah. presenters in that way? I mean, just looking at the helmets thing as well, my my youngest lad has just started competing in rallycross. I bought the most expensive helmet we could get. Tyres, car, everything else is done the budget. Helmet, he has got the most expensive helmet we could get for him because that is his head and it's my, my lad competing in it, you know. So when you look at it that way, it's kind of like... That's how I see things and how I perceive, you know, that sort of risk side of it all. And then, what was the question? Just for honest, <laughs> what was the other bit? Basically, all the stuff that is helping you not crash. Like when I go to the Autodrome Terramar, or once you have had that crash, it's the stuff that you put in to alleviate the danger, basically. We had nothing. Not even a helmet on. Like, But you just listed off all the stuff that was in that rally car to prevent that person from perishing really badly. I'm guessing, what was the result when Freddie rolled through the trees? Yeah, we put the car back in its wheels, he got out, apologised. 
Would not, you feel not a bit a bruised on inside? Oh yeah, or? you're going to have you know your your core muscles are going to you know tensed up a little bit for a rollover. Um, but yeah, it's it's that is why we have these cars with all that protection on because that's what protects you in stuff. So with all this stuff you've worked on, what is the one thing that you've seen through your eyes? You're obviously a very visual person. Like even when you're doing your planning, everything picture based, really visual. Have you ever looked at something and thought that could go wrong, pictured it, and then seen it happen in front of your eyes? Um, I have seen things go wrong and pictured it and then I have um, they have obviously happened and it's sort of like but I've put the things in place for it if you see what I mean so if you're doing stuff with monster trucks for example monster trucks will roll over their centre of gravity is in the wrong place if we go around a corner at that speed we had a monster truck on a TV show once roll over and I was actually running towards it with the firefighter before it rolled over because as it went into the corner, this is in Miami, as it went into the corner, not out of Florida, you know, out in the swamp, maybe yep. the swamp racing sort of stuff. As it went in the corner, I heard it rev and I'm like, they're dropping down a gear. And I go into this corner, I was like, I know they're going to take that corner at that speed without realising the centre of gravity. So we actually ran on camera, on the footage, you can actually see us running towards it before it's rolled over because I knew it was going to go. Because I'm thinking the speed that's doing with that centre of gravity, that's not going <laughs> to, that's not going to stick. And over it went. How easy is it, though, to miss stuff? And I'm going to use this as an example. One of the most carefully looked at racing series in the world because of the viewers, the spectators, the commercial value, commercial rights holders, Formula One. And you've got the FIA and then F1 is in Liberty Media. And I remember being upstairs in my house, rushing to get out the door to get somewhere, actually, but there was a race on at the time and I had it on my iPad. I was actually like carrying the iPad around once I was getting stuff, getting ready to go out. And I stopped in my tracks as I watched live in front of the eyes, Roman Grosjean slide into that barrier after being clipped at 180 mile an hour and then an enormous fireball erupting. And in the moment you're caught up in just your mouth open, you don't know what to say or think and just for the love of God, think, please don't say this person has just perished live in front of your eyes. I'm telling you, do you watch stuff like Formula One and see bits that they do wrong? Like how, how does something like that, how is that barrier in that place where that car, how has that not been planned is my point. Or is there scenarios where you just can't plan for something like that occurring? And there's one, there's one other one I remember seeing. It was the Grosjean one and it was a female racing driver. I'm not sure if you've seen this clip, but I don't know if it was an electric Formula E. But she came down, her brakes mm -hmm. failed. Bounces up in the air. And hit, yeah, and yeah. went through that. She went through the barrier, through the catch fencing, killed someone and it broke her back. Like, can you plan for that? So that, I know exactly what you mean with that. You know what we were saying earlier about when things go wrong, then you make changes afterwards. So with Grosjean, he went through that. What came out after? Well, sorry, it was before, wasn't it? He had the, the halo was before. Yep. But there had been so much learnt from that. They would have changed where the fuel cells are. They would have changed this. They would have changed that. Things and the halo, 100% saved, saved him being beheaded. He would have lost his head if that halo wasn't there. You know, that is such a, that, that halo is the best thing to happen to Formula One. It is so, so good. It, it, was, it was a halo car, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, was 2000 and, what's Grosjean, 2020? Yeah, 2020. Yeah. So we learn from things going wrong and they would have learned so much from that when you look at that accident they would have learned so much the bit where the car goes up in the air and literally I think it goes out of the track doesn't it and hits this advertising hoarding 180 yeah. mile an hour I yeah that is one of those things where you can only plan for so much so I've spent I've just spent the last three weeks in the Isle of Man for the TT on a big TV project for the TT it's like a, a new documentary series on the TT that's coming out it's going to be absolutely phenomenal but planning for that Anything can happen at the TT. You've got bikes doing 200 miles an hour on roads, not racetracks, on roads with public sat at the side and we're having to plan where we put cameras and where we put people and how we do stuff. And at one stage it was like, you can't plan for everything here. And the same with that. No one planned for that car jumping and going up in the air and smashing into that catch fence in high up. You can only plan for so much. You want to make it totally safe, don't go fast. Or don't have any spectators. Don't, um, you know, reduce the speed on it. But it's Formula One. You can't. So you've got to kind of get that that medium in it. And you do see stuff working. I was at the race at Silverstone. I can't remember, was it last year, the year before? I'm pretty sure it was last year. Where, oh, was it the year before? Year before last, when Joe 
the car flipped yeah. on the start line because I remember it was so hot and we were sat in the only stand at Silverstone that didn't have a roof on it as well and just sit down, beer in hand, thinking, God, just get this race going which is just so we can get into the laps so that at some point I can get back into an air-conditioned bubble. <laughs> like, And then literally the first corner we see on the camera, all the cars turning around it and one upside down going down the straight and he rolled over the barrier hit the catch fencing and that car sat between the barrier and the yeah. car fencing he's wedged in there but when you watch the videos just on people's camera phones and the stand you actually then understand how everything come together to work mm. to protect everybody that was sat in the tracks so that's a scenario I suppose where you can plan for that a car could carry on in the first corner and there's people sat there but you're just saying like with the Grosjean crash and the other one that's stuff that you just can't plan for yeah I mean you've got to so I used to do Jim Carn a grid when it used to happen all around the world which was like one of the best motivation events used to absolutely love it and obviously with Ken Block no longer with us it's been delayed now they might be bringing it back it'd be amazing if they do but with Jim Carn a grid it was such a short sharp circuit but we had cars doing proper speeds into the first corners and for example at the end of the straight we'd have uh, the VIP seating area and they want to be really close and watching it all so I'm thinking, right, how can, if a car does, say Solberg comes up at 100 and whatever into that and break, and there's brake failure, he's going straight on. What can we do? So I'm thinking, right, we'll have motorway catch fencing, then we'll have a metre gap, then we'll have another motorway barrier, so then a metre gap so we can decelerate. We'll have water-filled barriers at the front, so he hits the water barriers, they explode, water goes everywhere, but that decelerates. So it's just planning how to decelerate Water's a person like hitting concrete though it no? is but those if you know those red and white barriers that you get yeah, on, yeah. so then when you leave the top out you fill it with water and you leave the top out when you hit they will generally split because they're plastic and the water will shoot out the top as well so they great to decelerate you so they will decelerate but they won't stop so you then you put the uh, the concrete, massive heavy concrete barriers in layers behind, but the first one is a water barrier. You might even do one water barrier and a gap and then another water barrier just to go like boom, 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 just to decelerate someone before they then start hitting the concrete barriers. But those concrete barriers will move as well, which is why we won't have a camera crew between the concrete barriers. So our camera team say to me, oh, I'll be behind a barrier, mate, I'm all right. And I'm like, okay, that barrier moves, there's another barrier there, your feet are going to get wedged, you're going to lose your feet. So let's put you three layers behind and you'll have to get a better lens because you can just get a better lens and get the same shot that you need. So it's just about decelerating things when you design a track layout. And what's been the most enjoyable thing that you have worked on for you? Um, all the team that worked on this will say the same thing, Gran Turismo. Without a doubt, the best film ever to work on. Why? We, because it was just... All the mates that I've made over the years from this film or that film or this racing driver does that, it was all of us on the same film together for six months where Sony just put the trust into us all and into the stunt team that were running it all to do what we do. They put us all in this apartment block in Hungary for six months. We, um, we, we were all just a group of mates and it wasn't like work. It was like a group, of, we did... So have you seen the film? You know, it goes to Nürburgring. I actually have It's a great film. You need to watch it. But when I go to Nürburgring, on our days off, what do we do? Go and hire track day cars and do laps of the ring. It was just like all the car guys all together at the same time. Best job ever. But then there's been, there's been loads of been Top Gear. Top Gear for years was, you know, that's all of my mates. That's what we did. You know, we didn't go out. We would just meet up on, on Top Gear and stuff. A lot of my mates are just like the people from that. It was a, uh, the team and the bit I'm trying to get my head around is I've learned this through meeting and hanging around with my friends it is fun when all of you in a sense from what you've done can make a few quid because you can all enjoy and talk about certain bits and bobs for example like I can talk about cars are something that everybody gets on with it doesn't matter what car you've got across the globe or whatever you can have a conversation with someone in a pub when you sit down and talk about cars but we also like to talk about triumphant moments like when we've hit life goals or managed to get in a certain car and have achieved that thing that dream and what i'm fascinated by as we like coming to the end of this podcast is road to success is about how someone has got to where they've got to today and when i meet guests they've got to be a one unbelievably passionate and understanding of their subject matter, their field, what's going on, and genuinely enjoy it. It's like with what you've with what you told us, some of the shoots you've worked on are amazing. The people that you've worked with, the banter you can have is what fuels you and makes you want to do the job. 
And I think people get too caught up thinking because all a lot of the public see is the end result, the 458 Speciale, the 720S, the what's come out of the thing you're doing. But people like yourself, you're so unbelievably understanding of your subject matter, the field. And ultimately, you have to really enjoy it. I rarely meet people that are successful, that really detest what it is that they're doing. Maybe I need to start invest uh, interviewing the old banker from London. But the point I'm getting at is I'd love to understand at the end of this how someone that says they can't divide and take away and, to be honest, like me, do most forms of, of math is able to build a business where you're managing how many staff? So like 12 full-time, 50 contractors. Yeah. How have you turned that into a business? So, so how do you... You're in the moment, you're thinking, I was when you were listening out a second ago, like, oh, we filled these blocks with water, so they exploded and shooted up. Or I said, oh, we needed to do this extra and that extra. How do you charge for that? Because it's not like it's a product. It's, nah. it's a service, but it's not a pre-planned service. You're sort of making it up and picturing it as you go along. So how does one build a successful business from that? Yeah, so the... So ambulance and fire and safety advisors, that is kind of like there's industry sort of rates that we charge. It's all around the same sort of price that everyone charged for that. So that's quite easy. And the guys in the office, they quote it, they you know, make it all happen. What I do is the car filming side of things is quite bespoke and no one else does what I do. So my day rate is massive because it's so unique. But the thing is, I would do a lot of the stuff for free. Because I love doing it. Well, just explain that then, because your your business, as you said, you got got the staff, you've got the guys in the office, and you've got staff going out to all different sorts of stuff. You've got staff taking um, your own private ambulances and fire vehicles to the motorsport at the weekend. But you just mentioned, and your handle on Instagram is the car filming safety guy. Yeah, yeah. So when you're referring to you yourself as part of the business, and most people obviously think of the owner of a business up in his ivory tower, maybe not going and getting involved with everything. Explain what a day looks like as Andy Harris. It's, um, so it's either one of two ways. It's either I'm either running the business as a CEO, so I'm with the team, chatting to the team, helping them with stuff, giving them support, speaking to clients. Not doing taking away or dividing. No, I've got people <laughs> to do that for me because it makes no sense. My accountant gets proper costs for me because I look at stuff and I'm like, I've got no idea what I'm looking at. Um, that sort of stuff is the business. And that is maybe one or two days a week. Maybe not even that. Maybe one or two days a month sometimes. If I'm abroad, I could be abroad for four months. So I'm not actually within the business. So the secret of that is getting people that are a lot more intelligent than you, a lot more better than you at doing business. And that's what I do. I've got a great team. They run all that. And then my um, sort of stuff that I do, i.e. the safety, the coordination, the facilitating, the the contact, the middleman between all these people to make car stuff, filming things happen, is just me flying to somewhere, wrecking somewhere, meeting people, talking to people there, bringing contacts in, people that I know, um, putting a proposal together, saying this is how we're going to do this and this is how we're going to do it safely. Could even be, so like Red Bull Drift Shifters, Liverpool City Centre, myself and the team from Red Bull, we go meet the mayor of Liverpool and explain to the mayor what we're going to do and how we're going to do it safely. And the mayor of Liverpool is like, this is great. We love it. So I've got to put, I'm almost like a positive marketing facilitator. It's weird. So, so let me put myself in the mind of the viewer, the listener, and I'm sure they just thought, how? How have you just met the mayor of London? And why are you on Gran Turismo? And is all of this just through the first job leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next? Is is word of mouth your biggest source of revenue? Yeah. I don't think I've got, maybe I've maybe got two jobs through social media or through the website or something over the years. It's all through who you know, who you work with on your last job, who your contacts are. And what's so cool about this industry, especially the bigger feature film side of it, is it's full of people like myself that don't have many qualifications, aren't very academic, just know people are good at what they do, are dedicated to what they do, massively dedicated. And just, we all work together. And then I've got mates from this country, from that country. We all just kind of like come together and create something that, that generally works. And what I find quite funny about like this conversation is the kind of two different sides to it, because what you're doing and the whole premise of the business is to take a situation and take away risk. There's little risk as possible in everything you're doing. Yet ironically, where we're sat today recording is at your brand new facility that you've just taken on at the back of Shinfield Studios, just off the M4. That was a huge facility. But as you mentioned to me before we got in the van, it's a big risk. You've just taken on a huge lease, a massive new premises. And it's kind of like funny to hear because when you're doing stuff that's basically removing risk, 
in your actually own life, when you bring it into the business, you're actually adding risk. Why is that? Are you still trying to push to get to the next level? Even when you're the guy that's got the speciale and you've got the 720S and you've hit so many targets, where's your next level with this? Yeah, because I don't really have any targets now. My targets years ago was to turn over 100 grand a year and work on a Bond film. And I did both of them. And I haven't had any targets since. I've worked hard, really hard, like bonkers hard. So I haven't had a holiday for two and a half years. I, I work massive hours. I work really hard all over the world. I've, I've done two jobs in Australia in the same week. I've flown to Australia, done a job, flown back, and then flown back to Australia four days later. So there's a lot of traits. It's hard work. But it's kind of where I need it to be now. And as long as my team have got a job, as long as we have work coming in, as long as we enjoy ourselves, that is the thing. For me this year, because I'm not on a massive feature film at the moment, although that might change because a couple of meetings and stuff, but... I just want to kind of enjoy myself and do the cool things I like to do. Go to, um, you know, went to see Liam Gallagher the other night. You know, I want to start doing the things because I've spent 18 years working proper hard and I'm finally almost there. To so just give us a, um, a hand just for the timeline. So how old are you now? 47. Because that always helps put, put things into perspective. And when did you start your business? Um, I think I was around 30 when I started it. Would you have ever imagined that you'd have been in the position where you were picking up your 458 Speciale? No, no, no. And I still don't. It doesn't go in sometimes now. It's still surreal. And we, it's not just the cars. It's like the people that I'm meeting and the conversations I have and, you know, famous people having a conversation with them at work. Like there's some, you know, some of my mates on, on Instagram and stuff are like, I look and they've got like proper thousands, you know, they're like famous people and it's just like a mate of mine and it's just sort of like, it's very surreal, a lot of it, where I'm kind of in this industry where it's just, you know, it's really cool and I get to do really cool and I also I get to pick and choose which cool stuff I do as well. It's, it's great. And other than Gran Turismo, one more favourite memory from everything? I think there was one moment... This one moment when I realised, okay, I think we've made it now, was, do you remember something called F1 Live, F1 London Live, when we shut down Trafalgar Square yep. and Whitehall to so run? So everyone afterwards was like, now when's the London GP going Exactly, be? I know, I know. So that was massive. That was like the amount of people that turned up to that. And I remember we, I, I was running the track for that. So it was like I had to choreograph what F1 cars would go out when. I had to... Give it, I had to go up in a lift and do a safety briefing to all the drivers with Chase Carey, the owner of Liberty Media and Coulthard. And what was nuts about that was, because Hamilton didn't go to that event, he wasn't there. And when I walked in the room to give the briefing to all the drivers, I, it's all the F1 drivers. These guys are my heroes. I walk in this room, I scan the room, I look at Coulthard and I'm like, Lewis isn't in here. And Vettel was like in front of me where you are now. And Vettel just goes, yes, but I'm here, carry on. <laughs> it was just like the coolest moment ever and I'm like and that moment but when we wrapped that event it was only for like about an hour and a half show it was phenomenal I remember walking back it's like we'd wrapped it's all done my team were covering all the D-rig and I'm in amongst these massive crowds of people and there was this bloke next to me just I read him conversation his mate said to him you're going to go and watch the Kaiser Chiefs on the stage now because they were doing this performance at Trafalgar Square and he was like no nah. I think we've had all the excitement I need for today. He's like, that's fucking amazing. And I overhear this conversation. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I've created that massive thing with a team of people. We've made this massive live show with F1 drivers. And this is a moment, you know, this is kind of like, yeah, I'm there. And I never even said to the guy, you know, that was pretty cool. He just said there, but you we know. And that right there is you at an absolute high. The reason that you do what you do, the reason that most guests do what you do is because that is almost the biggest payoff you can get is when you're that satisfied and you have those moments created by the job and something interesting in the work that you do. But I do think it is important, like we spoke about that day on the horrific thing that happened with the rail, is that it's not always easy going to work. What's one thing or one day that if you could have changed it whilst being in your own business, MSS and safety, you would have would have gone back and done things differently? Oh, man. there's You can't count them in business because there's so many things that you do wrong and you think, oh, God, if I'd have done that differently, that wouldn't have happened. But again, that's where, that's where we learn, you know. My first 10 years in business was I hated it 
because it was things were going wrong, didn't know how to deal with people, didn't know how to deal with clients when things go wrong, didn't need to know how to deal with crew if anyone did something wrong with employing people. And it took me sort of like a good 10, 15 years. It's only really been the last three years where I've started to understand what it takes to run a company, to be a boss, to, to run things, to employ people, to support people. That's kind of... That's the, been the biggest eye-opener to me. That's been the biggest wake-up call. Because I think people glamorise if you've got a company and you've got staff. Yeah. I think from the outside world, that that's like a... It's, it's glamorised, if that's even a word, which, you know, you say, oh, I've got a company and I employ 30 people, for example. And what I've learned is half the time, especially from maybe even a web design perspective, is when I was a one-man band, it's actually making more money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and a higher percentage of money you, as regards profit turnover yeah, percentage. Yeah, exactly. You're running 50% margin More probably. money at the end of it. Not yeah. turnover, but turnover, vanity, profit, sanity. But my dad had this favourite quote, and I'm imagining it applies perfectly to your business as well, which is, businesses are run on really good people, but you can't keep all of the people happy all of the time. You can only keep some of the people happy some of the time, and that is the most stressful thing you'll ever deal with. Yeah. I think it took me, when we started doing like multiple million turnover a year, it suddenly happened. It was like, shit, this is big numbers. But I think I had this realisation. It's like you spend your first part of business trying to keep your clients happy. You get to a certain stage, then your job is to keep your staff happy and your staff keep your clients happy. It's just, you know what I mean? It's like all of my job now is to keep my team happy and to stop my team leaving. That is my priority. Keep them happy. I can't lose any of them. They're all amazing. They keep my clients happy. I don't need to speak to the clients sometime. I just need to look after those guys. I have one final question because many people do make it to the end of these podcasts. Some people have to stop halfway and pick them up another time. But I'm imagining that out there and amongst the thousands of views and listeners, there could be some guys that are working in the fire service. Maybe they're working with the government, getting in fire trucks every week, racing out. I've got a friend who's a volunteer firefighter and he went to horrific fire at a Premier Inn in Bristol. And those guys have obviously got this talent. They've got this, their brain works differently. They're able to face fear and run straight into it. I always like admire the people that I admire as the people that aren't even the most famous people in the world. Those guys that ran into the buildings during 9-11 and all sorts. But all those guys still could have a dream, a dream to turn what they're doing, this passion into something bigger to give them all opportunities. What is the one bit of advice that you can give if there is someone that works in the fire service or the safety is it easier to maybe forge your own business than they might think and go out and sell your services rather than working with the government? Or is it really hard? It depends. If you want an easy life, don't set up a business. <laughs> you know, but I think it's, I was once told of saying, um, if you want to be in business, never be the same as your opposition. Your client already has that. Be the opposite to your opposition. I always remember that, and I was like, "That makes a lot of sense." There's always there's so much stuff out there now in business. There's podcasts. There's this, for example. There's you know online. There's conferences. There's so much people can learn in business now to do it. But if you want an easy life, don't set up a business because, as you know, it's not easy. You know, it's difficult. But Andy there are Harris, good things. Thank you for coming on Road to Success. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. It was fantastic some of the stories you told some of the things that i'm gonna even leave with and actually i always try and leave with something and i think today one of those things will be watching my bank balance go down when i spend a lot of money on a very expensive helmet which i promise i will do and and the other one is actually trying to integrate just a little bit of our conversation into some of the things that we're going to be doing on youtube over the coming months so you never know this conversation right here might actually save lives so thank you so much it's cool thank you appreciate it